what I want to do tonight is I want to look at the parsha like we did the previous two weeks and look at the central theme of the parsha, the central mitzvah of the parsha, the eponymous mitzvah of the parsha, and to examine it and to probe it and to draw, I think, a fundamental Musr lesson, a fundamental lesson about life from the parsha that is, again, very broadly applicable, even though said mitzvah is not applicable at all. This week, the parsha is called Parsha's Chukas, and the very first mitzvah that we discuss is the mitzvah of the red heifer, of the red cow. Uh, broad strokes of that mitzvah is that you have a cow that's red. You tell it's perfectly red. It's got no white hairs, it's got no black hairs. It was never uh, worked upon the field and have a yoke placed upon it. And you take it to the temple. You slaughter it inside the temple. You bring it outside the temple. You burn it along with a whole mix of other ingredients. Then you have a huge mound uh, of ashes. You take the ashes, you mix them with some water, and then you have a potion that you're going to use to sprinkle twice on people that came into contact with dead people. Those people are called tame. Tame means impure, ritually impure. Those people are not allowed to go into the temple, and not allowed to eat sacrifices, and not allowed to participate in some activities. And in order, the only way for them to undo that is to have this red heifer process. So, for example, today, if you go to the temple in Israel, Temple Mount in Israel, there's bitch signs everywhere saying, according to Jewish law, it is prohibited for Jews to go onto Temple Mount. And the reason for that is specifically this law, because we all came into contact with dead people, either because we touched them, or we were in the same room, or we were in the same hospital as them, or we went to a gravesite, or we went near a gravesite. Uh, we all are considered as if we came in contact with dead people. We are ritually impure, and the only way to undo that, this week's parsha, you get a massive red cow, and you do the whole process with it, and the result is the potion, the formula that is used to sprinkle upon these people. Now, that's this week's parsha. Really strange process. Uh, and, of course, there's a lot more details that we're kind of skipping over here, but, for example, one of the things that's super count- counterintuitive is the fact that the person who sprinkles the potion, the ashes of the of the red cow, the red heifer, on the impure individual himself has to be pure, but then he himself becomes impure. So it's this weird process wherein the recipient, the subject of the red heifer ashes gets pure, is turned from impure to pure, whereas the conveyor of the red heifer ashes, he is pure, and then he flips to being impure. And the word chutas, the name of the parsha, is a description of a certain kind of law. There's laws. The law is a mitzvah. But there's a certain class of mitzvahs called chot or chutim. And these are mitzvahs that no matter what kind of mental gyrations uh, we uh, invest in understanding, we'll never understand it. In fact, the Talmud tells us Only Moshe was given by God the understanding of this mitzvah. Even King Solomon, who was the wisest man that ever lived, he tried all he can, and he couldn't get to the bottom of it. And indeed, there are some other mitzvahs like that. For example, if you go to any Jewish community, you'll find that there's someone in the community who is a shatnez expert. What's shatnez? Well, shatnez, we read a few weeks ago in the parasha, uh, appears twice in the Torah, you cannot wear a garment that's mixed with wool and linen. So if you have a very fancy suit, wool suit, really high-end manufacturer from Italy, sometimes they use linen in the lining or they use linen in the buttons. Well, that is prohibited to wear by Torah law. You can wear a wool garment. You can wear a linen garment. You just cannot wear a garment that's half wool, half linen. Why? We're not told. That's the law. Take it or leave it, Right. That's it. We're not, there's no explanation given. And that's a chot, another example of a chot, a mitzvah, that doesn't make sense to us. It's illogical even to us. You know, what's the difference? If, if linen is okay and wool is okay, well, what's, why is the marriage of the two prohibited, right? Uh, what's this whole deal with the red cow? It doesn't make sense to us. It's a chot. It's a decree, an edict of God that we have to obey without understanding. I want to 
kind of probe this idea. Um, if we can't understand it and we can't fulfill it, the red, red heifer mitzvah, is, is it possible to try to glean some lessons that are very applicable even though we don't understand it? Um, maybe another way of saying it, what's the lesson of not understanding? So I want to I kind of look at some other places in Jewish literature where the red heifer appears and to try to find a certain pattern that develops and use that to build uh, a theme, an insight that is very broadly applicable and then take that theme and superimpose that upon everything Musa-related, everything Torah-related, everything Mitzvah-related, everything Judaism-related, to really take this idea and uh, pull out a, a core principle that is very broadly applicable. So the first source is from the Talmud, and it's not the place you would expect. It's the Talmud in Kiddushin. And the Talmud in Kiddushin in the 30s, so it begins on page 30, and then 31, 32, 33, there is a discussion about the responsibilities of the children to their parents and the parents to their children. We know one of the Ten Commandments, you have to honor your father and your mother. Another mitzvah, you have to fear your father and mother, you have to have respect. You have to have trepidation for your parents. And there's a whole section of Talmud, four or five pages, discussing all the details of that mitzvah. On page 31a, the Talmud asks a question. How far does it go? What's the extent to which someone needs to honor their father and their mother? And the answer given is very surprising. They tell us, the Talmud does, that it goes as far as Dhamma ben Nisina. Dhamma, that's the first name, the son of Nisina. Who is this Dhamma ben Nisina? He's a non-Jew, an idolater, who lived in Ashkelon. Today, Ashkelon is one of the major cities on the coast in Israel. It's uh, slightly north of Gaza. And in that same region... Thousands of years ago, there was also a city of Ashtalon. And says the Talmud, if you want to know what's the archetype, what's the prototype, what's the personification of how far you need to go to honor your parents, you got to find this Gentile in Ashtalon. He's the example. Well, what's the story? The story goes that he was a diamond dealer. And he dealt with precious gems and stones. And one time... The Kohen Gadol, the high priest, the breastplate, was missing a stone. And it's a very precious stone, and it's a very unique stone. So they started going to various gem dealers to try to buy a replacement. And one of them was Dhamma Benesina. And the profit he would have made is astonishing. Yes, it's 600,000, alternatively 800,000 gold coins. And they come and they knock on the door and they tell him what they're there for. All the rabbis are there and they're the emissaries of the court, the emissaries of the coin Gadol. And he tells them, sorry, I can't do business because my dad, he's taking a nap and under his pillow is the key to the safe. I can't wake him up because that would be a dishonor to my dad. Go to the next guy. And they pick up and they leave and they go to the next guy and he loses the deal. That's the story. The Talmud says that, well, how far do you have to go to honor your father and your mother, even if it means forfeiting a huge deal? That's what the Gemara says. But then there's a postscript to the story. The following year, the Almighty gave him his reward. What happened? In his flock, amongst his cattle, a red cow, a red heifer, was born. Now, red heifers are not actually so unique. You see them in Texas, right? The Texas Longhorns, that's a red cow. For they brought it in from Spain. Uh, the notion of having a red cow, that itself is not such a phenomenon. What is unique about it is that the red cow is entirely red, doesn't have any white hairs or any black hairs. And Dhamma ben Asina, whoa, whoa, how would you know it? Amazing. A year later, after he has this episode, a perfectly pristine red cow is born in his flock. 
And again, the same rabbis come and they start negotiating with him. And he tells them, I know that this is something very important for the Jewish people. You need this. And I know I could charge whatever in the world. There's no price that you'll refuse me. But I only want to charge you whatever money I lost from the deal of last year. I recognize that this red cow was born to me in merit of me honoring my father. Therefore, I'm only going to charge either 600,000 or 800,000 uh, uh, gold coins for my profit. And they did. They bought it. And uh, the story is over. And the Talmud comments that we see someone who is not commanded, i.e., this is a non-Jew. He doesn't have Torah. He has the seven mitzvos. Amongst the seven mitzvos is not honoring your parents. What well, we see if the if the non-Jew who is not commanded to honor his parents, if he goes so far as to even forfeiting so much for for their honor, how much more so someone who is commanded? That's the end of the Gemara. I want to examine this this Gemara because I think there's um. There's, there's at least two questions, two obvious questions. The Gemara began with a pursuit of a definition of guidelines, of boundaries. How far does honoring your parents have to go? And I'm sure over the course of history, there were lots of people who honored their parents sufficiently. That's a safe assumption. Yet, after searching high and low to find someone that really embodies this principle— the best you could find is an idolater living in Ashtalon. You couldn't find some nice Jewish boy who honored his father and his mother sufficiently. Seems really strange. Why is it when we're learning, when we're looking, we're seeking for a, a model of someone who upholds this mitzvah properly, the only thing we find or the only example we present is a non-Jew, an idolater? That's one question. Another question. The individual, Dhamma um, Benesina, he recognized that the reward for honoring his parents is that he merited to have a red heifer. And it seems like from the Talmud that the Talmud agrees with that. It's not just that he said that, it's actually published for posterity in the Talmud because it's true. Why is this an appropriate reward for honoring parents to merit to have a red heifer? What's the connection between the two? That's two questions, I think, that will help us open up the subject. I want to look at another source about the red heifer. The verse in Exodus, right after the Jewish people left Egypt, seven days later they split the sea, and immediately after that, they traveled to a place called Mara. Mara is where they didn't have any water. And Moshe is shown a stick or a branch. He throws it into the water. The previously bitter waters sweeten. That's the verse in chapter 15, verse 25 of Exodus. And I'll read you the whole verse. Vayitzak al Hashem, and he cried out to Hashem. Vayoreyo Hashem ate. Hashem showed him a, a, st- a tree. Or a branch, and he threw it into the water, and the waters sweetened. And then the verse ends, Sham Sam Lo Chok Visham Nisahu. There it was placed for them a chok, umishpat, and a law, and there they were tested. What the verse cryptically says is that in this place, in Mars, so ten days after leaving Egypt. 40 days before Sinai, remember Sinai is actually 50 days after they left Egypt. So 40 days before Sinai, the Jewish people already received a chok, a law, and a mishpat, and a different a law as well. What are these laws that the Jewish people received prior to Sinai? So the, all the commentaries discuss that. There's a Talmud in Sanhedrin. The Talmud tells us on page 56b that the received the laws of Shabbos, the laws of jurisprudence, of dinim, and the laws of honoring parents. 
other sources, namely Rashi, in his commentary on that verse, he takes out honoring parents and he puts in its place red heifer. So according to at least one source, red heifer, that mitzvah, preceded Sinai. According to another source, that the, um, the mitzvah that preceded Sinai was honoring parents. Again, we see another connection between those two mitzvahs, honoring parents and red heifer. And interestingly, we see that there's something about this that is so critical and so pivotal and so crucial and so vital that it even needs to come ahead of time. Even before Sinai, before you learn something, before you learn the bulk of the mitzvahs, or at least you begin to learn the mitzvahs, there's certain preliminaries. There's the, the 101. This is some stuff you got to know. The prerequisites for Sinai uh, is uh, are these mitzvahs, or at least the connection between these two mitzvahs. So I think we have a list of five or four or five questions about uh, the red heifer. What's the deal with the red heifer? What's the meaning behind it? How is it uh, related to honoring parents? How is it related? Uh, why is it so important to come before Sinai? And I want to I wanna suggest an idea that will hopefully answer all those questions, but also that will launch us into a new understanding of mitzvot at large. Red heifer is a chok. It's an edict. It's a mitzvah that you don't understand, or you can't possibly understand it fully. Now, this is an exception. Most mitzvahs, you indeed can understand, and you can understand it much more deeply. Solomon was upset that he didn't understand this mitzvah. Other mitzvahs he did understand. And there's, in fact, there's books written to explain meanings behind mitzvahs. Uh, you get to the chok, and you have to raise up your arms and say, well, we don't know the reason. God has his reasons. We don't understand it. But the general, general, the general theme, the general thrust is that mitzvos can be perceived by human intellect. But there's an entire section of mitzvos that you'll never understand, no matter what you do, because it's limited to God's intellect. And human intellect does not interface with it. And the classic example of a mitzvah that you do understand, what's the most easily understood mitzvah? What's the mitzvah that makes the most sense? Well, that's honoring your parents. Think about it. Who do you owe more appreciation and gratitude towards than your parents? If not for them, you wouldn't exist. They brought you into this world. They took care of you from day one. It's a mitzvah that makes so much sense for you to at least do the minimum in in, in in payback, in appreciation. It's the most logical mitzvah, the mitzvah that connects the most to human intellect, right? They brought you to this world. Of course, you ought to honor and respect them. And indeed, this mitzvah is so universally understandable, it's so intimately connected to human intellect outside of, so to speak, the spiritual, religious realm, that even a non-Jew, Dhamma ben Asina, what does he know? He doesn't know Torah, he's an idolater. How did he recognize to honor his parents? He got there on his own. Because you don't need Torah to understand every mitzvah, you just need intellect to understand some, and no mitzvah represents the class of mitzvahs that is most understandable outside of Torah, outside of God, than honoring parents. And if you remember, going all the way back to Genesis, we have Jacob and Esau. And Jacob, of course, is the forbearer of the Jewish people, and Esau is the forbearer of all our enemies. We have Torah, he doesn't have Torah. Well, there was one mitzvah, the sages tell us, that Esau excelled at. He was, in fact, even better than Jacob at one mitzvah, honoring your parents. And there may indeed, just as a little sidebar here, the Talmud tells us that your parents bring you to this world. Your rabbi brings you to Olam Abba. For someone like Esau, who loved this world, 
it's much more natural for him to appreciate his father. Jacob is someone who's living for next world. And therefore, this world, it's almost an impediment to what he really wants. It's much harder for him to appreciate his biological parents. And it's much easier for him to appreciate his teachers because his teachers bring him to the world that he really wants. That's a sidebar. But regardless, we see that Esau doesn't have Torah yet. He has this mitzvah. Mitzvah is accessible outside of Torah, outside of God. Dama ben Asina, he's a non-Jew, yet he excels in this mitzvah. So that's one class of mitzvahs, mitzvahs we understand. Now, on the entirely opposite end of the spectrum, well, that's the red heifer. You don't understand it. It doesn't make sense to you. No matter how much you think, you can't get it. Only Moshe who was able to understand it. If you want to understand more about that, just as another sidebar. Sorry for so many sidebars. I spoke uh, yesterday. I gave a Parsha class, and I gave a whole explanation as to why Moshe was indeed able to understand it. Check that out on the Parsha podcast. Close sidebar. So, no, we can't understand it. So why do we do it? The only reason why you do it is because it's an act of faith. It's an action not supported by our reason, save for the fact that God instructed. So when you do the mitzvah of honoring your father, it's the most stacked towards a reasonable, in your head, reason to do this. And then on the entire other end of the spectrum, it's a mitzvah that you're doing entirely. It's an action because God tells you to do it. And your your brain, your mind is not with you. You're acting with your body, so to speak, but your mind is just receptive to God. It's taking the back seat. It's saying, I'm, I don't understand this. Only God understands that. I want to suggest that what's the purpose of a mitzvah? The purpose of a mitzvah is to become a great person. Of course, the mitzvahs together build us from the ground up. It changes who we are. It is an opportunity for someone to connect to God and to go against our predispositions. Humans are not predisposed to connect to God because we have a body, we have a Yetzirah. Comes along a mitzvah, and the mitzvah says, okay, do this, follow this activity, and you could reverse the conditions that you are presently in your default, you could reverse this trend away from God and start heading towards God. When someone does a mitzvah based solely on the fact that God says to, to do it, I don't understand it, it's just my action, I'm not, my mind is not participating, such an action crafts and forms and molds a person, and who does that? Well, that's God. The person is saying, I don't know how to build a perfect human. I'm not doing this mitzvah because it makes sense to me. I don't understand it. But I know that God understands it. And God told me, if you want the exact formula, the exact manual to achieve your greatness, do X, Y, and Z, 613 steps in this process, and you follow them to the T, you listen to the doctor's orders, and you'll you'll arrive at the end result. That attitude is critical to doing mitzvahs. If someone does a mitzvah only because they understand it, they're not actually changing who they are. They would have maybe done it otherwise. It made sense to them. There's no change in direction. There's no reorientation, reframing of who you are. You're exactly the same way you were. You would have done it without a mitzvah. Dhamma Benesina didn't have a mitzvah to do it. He did it anyhow. Esau, he wasn't going to have Torah, and he did it anyhow. That's not a mitzvah that changes a person. What changes a person? Where I wouldn't have done it, I would have done something else. Yet I chose to not do that something else because of God, because of Torah. I'm changing, I'm going the opposite against what I am inclined to do. My brain tells me, this is ridiculous. You're taking a red cow and you're slaughtering it in the temple and burning, burning, burning it, and burning it outside the temple. and this, is, this doesn't make any sense. There's no reason to it. And you say, no, 
I'm doing it because God is smarter than me. God has a more advanced brain. God created me and told me how to perfect myself. That is a myth where someone actually changes. And therefore, it teaches, I think, a, a critical point here. Just simply put, to understand why we do this mitzvah. That was our first question. We don't understand it. Well, that's sometimes precisely the point. Now, granted, most mitzvahs you do understand. But it's important for you to realize that even the mitzvahs that you do understand, it has to follow the model of the mitzvahs that you don't understand. If someone does, two people do a mitzvah. One of them does it because God tells them to do it. The other person does it because, well, I would have done it anyhow. Which one of them is more apt to change? If someone would have done it anyhow, you're not acting against your nature. You're not changing anything. You're just acting the way you're, you were programmed to act or you were inclined to act anyhow. You're not changing. If you do a mitzvah because God tells you to, God tells you to do the mitzvah, then you can achieve, you can unearth the tremendous power of the mitzvahs themselves. Torah is God's manual for living. It's the ways through which we can become great. To fully achieve that, there has to be a realm where we say, I don't know, God knows, and I'm going to rely on him. I'm going to ignore what I think. I'm going to stop, kind of put the brakes on my own predispositions and understandings. We're going to halt that for a little bit. And we're going to say, okay, God, you tell me how to act so I know how to change. This is a critical principle of all of Torah. So in, in a sense, in the mitzvah of red heifer is something that's cru- crucial for all of Torah because it really shows us why we do mitzvahs, what the objective of mitzvahs is. This is so important. It has to be told to us before Sinai. Before Sinai, you're about to get the greatest gift ever conveyed on humanity, Torah from God. This is alchemy. It's how to take lead, how to take a human that's not great and turn him into gold. That's what Torah is. However, there is a precondition to that. It's necessary for someone to say, let's learn the lesson of the red heifer. Let's understand how and why mitzvot change us. That is a precondition for everything else that's to come. Of course, the Almighty could have found a way to shoehorn these other three mitzvot in later. But it's important for it to be told to us earlier. Dama Benesina. He does a great mitzvah of honoring his parents, honoring his father. Amazing. He's the prototype. And what is his reward? Ironically, the reward goes to the opposite end of the spectrum. It's not something that's logical. It's something that's entirely illogical to human brains. What's the lesson? What's this connection? We see again and again that honoring parents is connected with red heifer, even though they seem to be opposites. The answer is, Dama bin Asina, you think that the mitzvah that you do is because it's logical to you. You're, after all, Gentile, right? What do you know about Torah? Nothing. So why are you doing the mitzvah? Because, well, it makes sense to me. My parents helped me. My parents brought me to this world. There's a lot of logical reasons to do that. Well, what's your reward? What's the real reward for every mitzvah? What is the power of the mitzvah that is truly transformational to change a person? Here's your red heifer. In every mitzvah, there is an aspect of red heifer in it. Every mitzvah, forget about red heifer heifer itself. Let's take red heifer as an idea. In every mitzvah, even in the mitzvah of honoring your parents, there's an aspect of the red heifer in it, that you're doing it just because God tells you to do it. Even the things that are most skewed to the logical, so to speak, side, we have to realize that what really changes us is the fact that we're doing what God tells us to do and we're the blank slate. We don't really understand God's crafting and forming and molding us to become great people. I want to take this a step further. The 
Mishnah tells us, Lo hamidrash hu ha'ikar, ela hama'aseh. Not the study is what's the most important. Rather, it's the action. We have part of the corpus, part of the uh, uh, the mitzvos. There's some of them that are intellectual, midrash, study, and there's some of them that are activity-based. Says the Mishnah in Chapters of the Fathers, Lo ha-midrash hu ikar Not the midrash, not the study, is the ikar, the most important primary objective. Ela ha-maseh, rather the action, doing. The Talmud goes a step further. Tachlis chachma, the goal of chachma, of wisdom, tshuva umaisim tovim, is repentance and good deeds. Again, the chachma, the wisdom, well, that's in your head. The deeds, well, that's in your body. What's the objective? What's the end goal of the intellectual connection to Torah? Is the physical activity where someone does something, good deeds. So I want to kind of take this to the next logical step here. We talk about Musr here. So this is the, after all, the Musr Monday, right? You learn about good character. You learn about Midos. You learn about how to behave. You learn about how to become great. You learn about how to transform yourself, how to recreate yourself. So when is the Musr study? When is the primary Musr learning? What I'll tell you is it's not from 7 to 8 on eight on Mondays. It's from 8.30 when you're done till next week at 7.30 and you come back. Now you're learning. Well, learning is the first step. That's, so to speak, the intellectual aspect of it. But that's not the most important thing. The ma'aseh, the, act, the, act, the action is the most important thing. That's what we learned from Red Heifer. And therefore, it's important for us to, to, to take, and this is, I think it's, it's a little scary. Because, you know, we think, well, we study Torah. Well, what could be greater than that? Nothing is greater than that. But learning something in your head is not enough. That is, unless that's actualized... It stays in your head. What good does it do for you? I would even argue that it does bad for you. And hear me out. That's a shocking statement. How could Torah be bad? Torah is the best thing that ever existed. Well, maybe if someone studies Torah without taking the lesson of the red heifer with him or her and not is saying, I'm studying it only based on academic. It's only academic. Well, who are you cutting out of your world? You're cutting God out of the world. You're saying this is not godly. This is not God's instructions how to become great. This is some sort of exercise. This is some sort of intellectual pursuit. How could that be a good thing? How could it be okay to take God and cut him out of Torah? Which is the opposite of faith. There's two kinds of learning. There's a kind of learning which is the holiest, greatest thing in the world, a learning that will bring about to action. And there's a kind of learning where someone cuts God out of the equation, says, I want to learn just for learning's sake, and I do not want to obey it. Well, that's actually a bad kind of learning. It's a bad kind of intellectual um, pursuit. So I I I want to go look a little bit towards next week's Parsha. Next week's Parsha, we, we, re, we meet one of the strangest characters in all of Torah, Bilam, or Balam, pronounced in English. Uh, this is someone who is a great prophet, a prophet on par with Moshe. However, he utilizes his powers for evil, namely for trying to curse the Jewish people amongst a bunch of other misdeeds. And in fact, the whole week, next week's Parsha tells the whole story of Bilaam's failed attempts to try to curse the Jewish people. Ultimately, he comes up with a scheme that results in many, many Jewish dead. Now, I think this is a prime example of this tension that we found here. Bilaam, the verse tells us, is Yodea Da'as Elyon. He knows the Da'as, the knowledge of God, the 
lofty knowledge. Bilaam's problems do not stem from his intellectual realm. He knows God's knowledge. Well, think about what kind of statement that is coming from the Torah. Yet we see that his behavior is heinous. And I think he's the prime example of someone who specifically because he had great intellect, he had great knowledge, he had, so to speak, the Torah of the mind, that led him down the path of corruption. Let's build this story out. First of all, the Talmud asked the question, why was someone as corrupt, as rotten, as Bilaam, why was he given prophecy? And the Talmud says, in the future, the Jewish people are going to be recognized as being God's people. We're going to have all the spoils. And the nations are going to come to God and say, it's not fear. Why is it not fear? Well, the Jewish people, they had Moshe, the greatest prophet ever. And he was the one who led them towards the right path. If we had someone like Moshe, we too would be like the Jewish people. That's why we have Bilaam. Because Bilaam was indeed like Moshe. He's the equivalent amongst the non-Jews of Moshe. So God will tell the non-Jews, well... Sorry, that excuse won't work. You actually had someone like Moshe. And look what you did. Look where it brought you to. That's what the Gemara says. Now, we see that obviously there is a need to give prophecy to a Gentile. Because you have to have someone who's the equivalent of Moshe or else there's a decent decent claim that the non-Jews have that we could have been like the Jewish people. Fine. But why give it? If you have to give the prophecy to a Gentile, at least find someone who's not as corrupt as Bilaam. If you have to give it to a non-Jew, sure, fine. Find someone who's more righteous. If there is a need to do it, give it to someone who is at least moral and upstanding. I want to suggest that the sequencing here is off. It wasn't that Bilaam was corrupt and rotten and specifically Bilaam was given prophecy. No, Bilaam was fine. Because he was given the great prophecy, he had, so to speak, the Torah without the red heifer, so to speak. He had the knowledge, but he didn't have the action. Therefore, he became corrupt. And this goes back to our central thesis that there's a tremendous danger of studying intellectually alone and not applying it. It actually is worse. It's injurious. It's deleterious. It makes you, you're better off not studying if the studying is not going to lead you to action. The Talmud tells us, and this is, I think, the best proof, no further proof is needed to this principle. Zaha. If someone is meritorious, na'asis lo sam hachayim. The Torah is compared to an elixir of life. However, the word elixir or potion is sam. Sam can also mean poison. Well, which one is it? Says the Talmud, it depends. If someone is zacha, if they're meritorious, it's sam hachayim. It's an elixir of life. If it's lo zacha... If it's, he's not meritorious, it's na'asis lo sam hamavis. It becomes a potion, a poison of death. What this says is that Torah, i.e. intellectual greatness, is a great amplifier of action. If someone is righteous in their action, then the Torah is an elixir of life. It's the best thing ever. If someone is corrupt in their behavior, then ironically... The Torah is actually worse off for them because it amplifies the bad behavior and it becomes a poison of death for them. I want to I conclude with another wrinkle that I think is really interesting. And that's the golden calf. The golden calf, uh, we know that uh, the golden calf happened a mere 40 days after the greatest experience in the history of humanity, the experience at Sinai, an entire nation of people that are able to ascend to the greatest heights of prophecy. And these, this, is, this is a nation that experienced the 10 plagues in Egypt, splitting of the sea, they're eating manna every day, 
surrounded by constant miracles. They have the experience at Sinai. 40 days later, they sin with the golden calf. Now, of course, we, we're we not talking about the details of the golden calf. That's a whole class on its own merit. What happened? What was the sin? Where, what they, where did they go wrong? But the obvious question is, how was it possible for a nation that has had, has achieved such great heights for them to descend to such terrible lows and to act in a way that's almost akin to idolatry, whether it's exactly idolatry, what exactly they did is it, all the commentaries trying to understand the details, but certainly it had a, an aspect of idolatry. How is that possible? So I think in continuation with our theme, we could say is that the people, yes, they had all these tremendous experiences and all these insights, but they didn't have action. They didn't know how to take what they know and infuse it into a behavior. And therefore, they weren't able to capitalize on what they knew, and therefore what they knew, in fact, helped them become corrupt. If they didn't have Sinai, they wouldn't have done the golden calf. If they didn't have the great achievements of their intellect, they would not have descended to the lows of the golden calf. So let's bring us full, full circle. Rashi in this week's Parsha, he connects the red heifer, which is a mother cow, to the golden calf, which is a baby cow. And Rashi says that these are actually connected. And he gives an example. Suppose you have a palace. In the palace, there is a maidservant. And she's there, and she's part of the maidservant quarters, the palace of the king. And she has her child with her, and the child comes and soils the floor of the palace of the king. What does the mom do? The mom quickly comes and cleans up the mess. Similarly, you have the golden calf, the baby cow. The baby cow soils and corrupts the Jewish people. Who is going to fix that? Who is going to clear away the mess? Who is going to undo and rectify the sin? The red heifer. So now, simply put, we could say, well, this is a baby cow. This is a mother cow. Sure. But on a very deep level, we really understand a tremendous insight. The sin of the golden calf was the fact that they had all insight, all intellect, and no action. How do you fix that sin? With the red heifer, which is all action and no insight. And therefore, specifically what went wrong with the golden calf, where they were, they, their mind was just replete with understanding but they didn't have a way to actually, they didn't have Torah and a way to kind of bring that into the real world, to act upon what they knew. And that, like Bilam, and like bad people who take the Torah and turn the Torah into a poison of death, it led them astray. Comes along the red heifer and shows them how it's done. You have to have a component of the red heifer of doing a mitzvah, the mitzvah of the mitzvah's sake, action, not relying on your own intellect, relying on God's intellect, all action, no intellect, and that's going to uh, fix it. There are a few statements that I want to add to just complete this, and then one more, I think, fa- foundational insight. The Talmud says a person should accustomize them to themselves to saying, is the Talmud in Brachos, a person, Yargil Atzma, a person should get used to saying, Aini Odeh, I don't know. Wait, wait a minute. Isn't Torah about trying to acquire knowledge, acquiring Torah? Any Odea, I don't know. Torah, after all, should be about, we, we should become a, a people of the book, a people of knowledge. Yes, we're not trying to encourage ignorance. But it's important for a person to remember, Any Yodea, I don't know. That's how I approach Torah. I want to know from God. God, you tell me, and I'll behave based upon what you tell me, not 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 going to give my own commentary, not that I'm going to do only the Torah that I understand. I'm going to do a dose of the red heifer that I don't know. And that's how I'll achieve my greatness. One, uh, one source. I want to share with you another source which I found very powerful. Uh, a few weeks ago in the parasha, we read about Moshe counting the Levites. What was unique about the counting of the Levites 
was that they counted from the age of one month. So little babies still in their bassinets are being counted. So Moshe tells God, how am I supposed to know how many Levites there are in the tents? How many little baby Levites? I'm going to go into every bassinet and every nursery room and start counting the babies? So God tells him, Ata ase shelcha, you do your job. Ani e'ase sheli, I'll do my job. And Moshe goes to the entrance of the tent. He does his job. He goes as far as he can fulfill. And God tells him how many babies there are inside the tent. I think this is a good motto. A good motto for understanding the objective of Torah. We do what we need to do. God tells us what you do do, and you don't worry about how those dots connect. You can rely on God's intellect. He will do his. He is giving you a regiment, how to become great, the idiot's guide, by God, Torah. Do your job, follow the instructions, and he'll do his job. He'll make you great. And another axiom that we find several places in Jewish literature, uh, famously about Nimrod. Who was Nimrod? Well, Nimrod appears at the end of Parshish Noach. He is the king of the Tower of Babel. And there's this really strange statement about Nimrod. Yodea et ribono. Nimrod knew his master. Umit kaven limrod bo and intentionally rebels. And this is something that we're not used to hearing. Nimrod knew all about God. Well, if you knew about God, why are you rebelling? He intentionally rebelled. So this is a great example. Nimrod was someone who wasn't lacking intellectually. He was lacking in his behavior. He knew God, all about God. And indeed, because he didn't inject that into change, into action, into behavior... Therefore, it led him astray. He was trying to rebel against God. I want to share with you a quick little nugget where the objective of tonight's talk is to contrast Torah, intellectual understanding, insight, with mitzvos, actions, doing, fulfilling, working. Perhaps we could say, When someone understands something, the intellect, that's the seat of the soul. The action, that's the seat of the body. Which one of those is most important? Well, obviously, the soul is more important. However, which one of those demands us that we change? That's the body. We have a perfect soul and an imperfect body. Those two are going to harmonize. The only question is, which one is going to change which? Is the body going to defile the soul, make the soul lower? Or is the soul going to uplift the body, make the body higher? Of course, the soul is the objective. Torah, intellectual knowledge, is the objective. However, our procedures, our growth is done with the body. By changing the body, uplifting the body, doing mitzvos, the body becomes par, so to speak, with soul. Now, par will be great, but it becomes more soul-like progressively, and therefore the harmony that we create with our body and soul is changing the body to make it mold the soul and not, God forbid, the other way around. And I don't want people to walk out today with the misunderstanding that Oh, well, Rabbi Walby just said we don't need to study Torah. Because that would be a grave misunderstanding of what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that there's a way to study Torah. There's a, a correct way to do it and there's an incorrect way to do it. The correct way to do it is as exemplified by the red heifer. This was so important. Before we got any Torah, learn this lesson. Red heifer, do. Find a way to whatever you know, do. Whatever you understand, implement. Whatever's in your brain, in your mind, find a way to migrate it towards your heart, towards your body, towards your understanding. If you don't have Torah, if you don't learn anything, you're doomed to fail because then you don't even have a head start. 
Of course, you start with Torah, but what kind of Torah? The kind of Torah that will engender action. Torah is indeed greater because Torah brings to action. There is a certain kind of Torah that's the elixir of death. That's the potion of death. That's the poison of death that you want to avoid. That's what Bilaam did, and that is a grave danger. However, Torah, of course, is the greatest thing that we have, and it's our taking our tool towards greatness, provided that we don't forget the lesson of the red heifer and we don't allow the Torah to remain relegated in our mind, we find a way to actually implement it in our body.